chapter 4, let me just uh, pray before we get into this. Heavenly Father, we just ask now that as we turn our eyes towards your throne, literally, Lord, in this text, your throne, that you would just meet us, you would give us that grand vision of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have finished the seven letters to the seven churches that Jesus wrote. We finished them, and now we are turning to the next section of the book. You may have noticed, or you will notice as we go through, the tone and the theme of the book of Revelation changes quite considerably now. We have seen the risen, glorified, soon-coming king, and now we are going to see him start to come back and reclaim his kingdom from those who have usurped it. However, before we see that, before we move into this time of history that is going to be pretty rough to read about, John sees a vision of God, the throne room of God. And I believe this is put here chronologically because it is necessary. All that is about to transpire on the earth, he must see the sovereign Lord enthroned in heaven. And there is a reason for that. I believe what we're about to read is one of those things that is almost too marvellous for fallen humanity to comprehend. Do you remember when Paul said, things which I have not seen, ear have not heard, things of which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. I feel like we're almost treading on those sort of things here. What we are reading is going to be a glimpse into something we cannot really understand. Yet, at the same time as John, I believe, needed it, it's also something we need in this day and age. A vision of the one true God, a vision by which we can put all of reality into its proper perspective. We live in a, an age that by all accounts, does seem in many ways to be spinning out of control. A place where the kings of the earth have their day, a world where evil often reigns and entangles itself amongst all of our earthly institutions, a world where injustice and wickedness are rewarded and they prosper. And this vision that we see here in Revelation chapter 4 reminds us that one day all these things will come to an end all things will be put right. There is a different reality to this world and that is the reality where our future lies. So we are going to read the whole of chapter 4 because we need to read it as a... a, The whole chapter just has to be read together, really. We're not going to get through the whole of chapter 4. We're only going to do a few verses, but I want us this week and next week we're going to read the whole chapter together. So let's stand, please, as I read Revelation chapter 4. If there ever was a time to stand, it's reading chapter Revelation chapter 4. You'll see why as we get into it. So it says, Revelation 4 verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he, who, and he who was sitting was like jasper stone and sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne comes flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the centre and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle, and the four living creatures, each, of, each one of them having six wings, full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives for ever and ever, the twenty-four elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives for ever and ever and will cast their crowns before him, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and they were created. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So this is our scene in the throne room of God. Now, if it's your first time hearing something like that, you'll see why this book is classed as an apocalyptic book, that the way that that imagery is described can be quite confusing. We will go through it step by step, and I'll try and make it as clear as we can for you. Let's look at that first verse. 
After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. Do you remember in the very first chapter, Revelation chapter 1, I said that there was a divine chronological outline for this book given to us. It says, therefore write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. That was from Revelation chapter 1. That was our outline. So you had the things which you have seen. That was the vision of the glorified king that we saw in chapter 1. The things which are were the seven letters to the seven churches. And now we are moving on to the next phase of this book, which is with that little phrase, the things that take place after these things. And I believe you have that two times in this first verse now to connect us to that uh, chronology. This is the prologue of the book that's going to take us into the future things, the things that we would call eschatology, the fancy word that means study of the end. And like I said, you'll notice now that the genre of this book changes. We're going to see lots of symbols, lots of things that are very hard to describe. But, as I said in the introduction, most of these are explained for us somewhere else within the Bible, and that's why Revelation is really the product, the end product of all of the Revelation that has gone before it. So we're going to be in many different places in the Bible as we go through this book. However, before we get into this, I do want to take a little moment to speak to you about prophecy, what we actually mean when we say prophecy, because it can have a lot of different connotations for a lot of different people. So I really want to nail this down actually before we um, get into this book. So let's start by saying what I'm not talking about when I'm talking about prophecy, and I use that word. I'm not talking about psychics, not talking about mediums, astrologers, clairvoyants, quantum healers, whatever you want to call them today. I'm not talking about people like Nostradamus, I'm not talking about people like Derek Acker or TV psychics, whatever you want to um, put in that bracket. In fact, the Bible specifically forbids all of those things, the above aforementioned things, and it attributes any power, if they're, if they're fraudulent, a lot of them are, but if there is any, anything that they do have that is unusual or unexplainable, the Bible says that that is from the power of the occult and the Bible specifically forbids you from being involved in it for your own protection. Now we may sit here and think, well, it's just, you know, only weird people get involved and do that. And I would just ask you to reconsider that. You know, these are not just things that are happening in some tent at a medieval fair. And this is 1066 country, I'm not knocking medieval fairs, we do them here, don't we? But... Uh, do you know what I mean? That's, it's, not, it's not the old late, you know, these things are massive now, in fact. It's a $2.8 billion business, uh, and it's blown up on social media, particularly amongst the younger generation. Um, these things are huge right now. It's not just a tent. They have very slick Instagram pages. They all display lives of luxury and ease. Their work is featured in Vogue, GQ, Vanity Fair, all these popular magazines, and on and on it goes. This is interesting but also it's a real rebuke I would say to the church in many ways. This is an article, Global Newswire. Ten clairvoyant psychics and mediums to watch in 2021. And I read through them and it's again you can go on all their pages and look these people are massive, they have huge followings and people are engaging with them regularly. This is an article from the Guardian newspaper just at the end of last year. Look at the subheading. Well, you can't see it there, but I'll read the subheading to you. It says, From astrology to tarot, interest in the mystical arts has flourished during the pandemic. So this is very current. This is 2020 onwards. It goes on. It says this. Forbes magazine reported a 136% rise in people seeking supernatural readings in societies where religious belief is dwindling and trust in the establishment is under threat. The idea of looking elsewhere for guidance to the stars or beyond, if you, if you believe in a beyond, has made a kind of sense. Now you see, the world is in a time of upheaval. People feel it, Christian, non-Christian, religious, non-religious. People know something is happening that is not quite right right now. There are lots of things that are unexplained and the ex explanations are not meeting the needs of what an explanation should be. But they do not know where to turn for answers and in desperation they are turning to what the Guardian says mystical arts I would 
rather than say mystical, I would say dark arts, actually. That is the correct terminology there. They turn to the occult, quite simply. However, the occult doesn't wear black robes anymore with a pitchfork. That's not the occult. The occult now runs multi-million dollar businesses, they drive fancy cars, and they have very popular YouTube channels. Like I just said, they get featured in Vanity Magazine and GQ. That is what is happening now. I'll remind you the words of Leviticus 19.31 from the Old Testament. The Lord challenged the nation of Israel. He said, do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out or be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. His point was, you come to the Lord. I have given you the revelation you need. And we're going to see that as we go through this book. I want you to notice one more thing in connection with that Guardian article that I have on the screen there. This rise is seen in nations where religious belief is dwindling. Now that is a challenge for us right now. We are in a time in the Christian world, in the UK and in the States too and in the Western world, there are more Christian resources available than ever before. More, a million, anything you could get at the touch of a button right now pretty much if you wanted to. However, at the same time, religious influence is dwindling. You see there is a massive disconnect in people's hearts between what we are saying Christianity and religion is and how people are seeing it played out in the world and in their own lives. And it has always been the church's job to bridge that disconnect. However, it seems to be that something is happening that we are missing. In a time of trouble, people do look for answers. When things are spiraling out of control, they want help and they want guidance. And what do they find? And tragically, articles like the Guardian one would imply that they're not finding the voice of the church, which is supposed to be telling the glorious gospel of salvation. They're finding the voice of the government in many ways. As we work our way through this book, we're going to see a lot about government and world rulings. This is not where, something, where people should put their trust. One of the dangerous things for the church is, is that we end up being just an extension of the government. That's, how a church goes, that's where a church goes to die. Do you remember we read about that in one of the letters to the seven churches, the one that mixed with the state of the Roman emperor? Jesus did not have a lot good to say about that. But it also says trust in the establishment is under threat. That's because of the overload of information that we have, it's because of all the lies and hypocrisy that have gone on over the years. No one knows who to trust, even if they are telling the truth. The default position is, I'm not going to trust you anyway. And because of that, people are neither going to the church nor to the government and as the Guardian said, they are seeking something more spiritual because man is spiritual, mankind are a spiritual race, that's who we are. They are turning to the spiritual, the mystical arts. What a rebuke that is. I believe Jesus would shout like he did to the church of Sardis, wake up, church, wake up. Recapture your first love like the church at Ephesus needed to. Keep my word and do not deny my name. They are the marching orders of the church. It was that church that was doing that that he had nothing bad to say against. So whilst we are involved in many different things in this world, we must never, ever come away from those fundamental principles. If we do, I believe, well, read that article from The Guardian. That is the lesson that we need to learn. The influence goes. We need to do that. The church is called to be different. It's called to be set apart. It is called to be the body of Christ on this earth. We must be about the king's business when we do that. And if we are not in the word of God, we are not preaching the gospel. If we are not understanding how the biblical worldview applies to all areas of our life, not just what we do on Sunday mornings, we will lose the voice, the influence that we have. And that is what we need to be doing. When the world is offering superficial solutions to the wrong problems, I would say, this is where the church needs to be showing them exactly where to look in the darkness. I've talked to you a lot through these books already about the imagery of darkness and light. There is a very good reason why Jesus called himself the light of the world. Because when you put light in darkness, darkness flees and people are drawn to the light. That is the point. The word of God is said to be a lamp, remember. We use it to guide our feet in this world as we walk and follow the light of the world. And as we do that, when people see that you are following Jesus Christ, the light, they will also join and follow. That is the whole point of the imagery going on here. And out there is darkness. We need to remember this. We need to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ pro properly. Now, why have people forsaken that message 
and are turning to the mystical or the dark arts. If I could put it very simply and bluntly, it would be simply, we have forsaken the word of the Lord. And this is exactly what Israel did. They had the same warning and the same message, but yet they forsook the Lord to hew for themselves their own systems. They forsook the fountain of living water and they ended up trying to go alone. And they end up being deceived and seduced by everything that they shouldn't have been. And they ended up going into captivity. A huge part of the Old Testament is about that lesson. Let us simply heed the word of God and learn that lesson without going through that ourselves. We need to return to the beauty and the majesty and the message of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And if there is any way to do that, it is by looking into the throne room of God. And that is what we're going to do this morning in our text. But again, let me just go a little bit further. Charles Spurgeon, 1866. Times were pretty tough in 1866. He lived and ministered through the great cholera epidemic that swept through London, killed a lot of people. He preached a sermon on Amos 3, where he was answering the question of why this was being allowed to happen. Why questions are great questions. Everyone has why questions about these different things in life. People now have why questions, like I said, and they're turning to various different sources to get them. He answered it like this when uh, someone asked him why is God allowing this. And he said, if you ask me what I think to be the design, I believe it to be this, to waken up our indifferent population, to make them remember that there is a God, to render them susceptible to the influences of the gospel, to drive them to the house of prayer, to influence their minds, to receive the word, and moreover, to startle Christians into energy and earnestness that they may work while it is still called day. Sometimes things come to us in this world through no fault of our own that make us think. Uh, they remind us that we're mortal, that one day we're going to die. We need to figure out what all this faith thing is about. We encounter these things on a daily basis. And sometimes the church, again, if we've been too comfortable for too long, needs to be woken up a little bit to understand what the importance of the message is that we have. This is crucial. Times like this, like Spur Spurgeon had here, like many people have in parts of the world, like we've had over the last few years, they do turn people's minds towards greater things. That is an opportunity for the church. I know I shared this with you at the beginning of the pandemic, but it was actually supposed to be one of my illustrations for the book of Revelation. Hidden away in a chateau in France is one of the greatest religious works of art that we have to this day, in that beautiful um, castle there, basically. In their basement, they have what is called the Apocalypse Tapestry. I've never heard of that. It's an ancient medieval work of art, absolutely massive work that was produced uh, many years ago. And it is basically a woodcut or a panel of every chapter of the book of Revelation. It's actually on my bucket list. <laughs> it's an awesome bucket list I do have. But I'd like to actually go there and spend time in my Bible and um, actually wander around and look at all of those panels. But this was created right after a huge time of war and pestilence in, in medieval Europe. And it just shows, again, the sort of attitude that people have when things get bad, people start looking outside of themselves to different sources for information. There's a, uh, a doctor called Natasha O'Hare. She wrote a book about uh, art and the book of Revelation. She made this observation. She said, people turned to Revelation in difficult times as they are attracted by its deterministic worldview and its black and white certainty. She goes on, the difference between then and now is that then they had an unshakable belief in the new Jerusalem. It was a happy ending. In a way, for them, it was serene. Now, people don't. They don't quite know what is the truth, where to turn to for these answers. And I would say once again, this is a great opportunity for us to once again show them that the book of Revelation, the worldview that we find throughout the Bible, is in fact true and Jesus is the King. And we will be doing this now as we go through. So that's all by way of introduction to state what prophecy is not, but also ways that we can use prophecy to draw people to the Bible. Now, so let's talk a little bit about what prophecy is. The purpose of prophecy, firstly, is simply to prove that God exists and his word is true. That is one of the main reasons he gave it to you. 
Isaiah 48, verse 3 to 5, the Lord said this to Israel. I declared the former things long ago, and they went forth from my mouth, I proclaimed them. Suddenly I acted and they came to pass. Therefore I declared them to you long ago, before they took place, I proclaimed them to you, so that you would not say my idol has done them. Before they took place, the Lord made sure that he told his nation, writ it down, recorded it, that's much of what the Old Testament is, so that when they did come to pass, there was no excuse for them not to listen to him. This was one of the purposes of, of prophecy. There are 31,000, just over 31,000 verses in the entire Bible. 8,500 of those are what we would call predictive prophecy. That's about 30% of the entire Bible is made up of this sort of material that is supposed to confirm that God's word is true. There are prophecies about nations, about cities, about the Messiah, about the rise and falls of empires. There's amazing things in there if you've never heard them. There are two types of prophecy in the Bible. We classify them by what we call fulfilled and unfulfilled prophecy. If you were here last week, I shared a list of what we would call fulfilled prophecies from the Old Testament that focused on the person of Jesus Christ. And they're the ones that we could see in history that have been fulfilled by one person and one person alone. The other group of prophecies are unfulfilled prophecies. And this is mainly what the book of Revelation is going to be looking at. Now here's the question that we have. When you're talking about unfulfilled prophecy, it's very easy, we've seen this in the world, for people to make a prophecy and say, oh, it's going to be fulfilled years in the future, and then you can't really prove them wrong, can you, until you, you might not be around. That's, that's the catch. And this is why God made sure that he gave so much prophecy in the Bible that will be fulfilled in the very near future in their lifetime that we can still look back on and see was fulfilled so that when we're looking at the unfulfilled prophecy, we can have confidence that it will be fulfilled just as the other ones have been fulfilled exactly as they were written, 100%, no mistakes. That's the reason. And when you hold these two together, you can enter into the book of Revelation with absolute confidence that what God says is going to come to pass. God has proved his word to be true. That's what Jesus, part of what Jesus' mission on earth was here to do, other than all the other things that he did. The standard for prophecy, and we see this a lot, and I even see this creeping into the church in many ways, an attitude that seems to imply prophecy can be wrong sometimes and all these different things. And this is exactly what you see if you're looking at mediums, isn't it? Well, you know, 20% they might manage to get a few things right and 80% is wrong. Sometimes it's so vague that you can't really tell whether it's right or wrong and it's all down to someone's subjective interpretation. Forget about all that nonsense. That's really not what I'm talking about here. God said to the nation of Israel, you know a false prophet by this. If he gets it wrong once, you remove him from the nation of Israel. That is a false prophet. That is what it said. God holds him up, holds himself and his word up to that standard because he doesn't need ever to make a mistake. God knows everything. He is all in all. He can say 100% accuracy. That's one of the reasons he gave that standard was so that you would know that everything else is false and he is true. He doesn't need anything else than that. 100% accuracy. It is to separate the word of God, the Bible, from all other religious holy books, all other religious systems, all of the other nonsense that we see that trying to tap into this sort of spiritual language that we use. It is the word of God and the word of God alone that can guarantee that sort of accuracy. And only through Jesus Christ. And that is what we are looking at now in the book of Revelation. Let's look at verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. So he says he was in the Spirit, and this, he obviously, remember, he's on the Isle of Patmos here, that little Roman colony, that prison colony. So this would be what we would call, he is given a vision into the heavenly realm. Now this is not something that I'm advocating that you go and listen to everyone who's having visions. Again, remove yourself from all of that stuff. This is a specific, unique event that God gave to the Apostle John at this time because he was about to communicate and receive divine revelation that would be recorded in the book of the Bible that would then go on to nourish the entire church for 2,000 years until he comes. Yes? So this is different than just understand what I'm saying here. He was in the Spirit. And then it says, and behold. You'll see that word a few times. And behold. It means look, pay attention, and behold, a throne. And that is really the pin drop moment. Look, behold, a throne. If you don't know anything else about heaven, about this world, that is what you need to understand. There is a throne. This is the first thing that John sees in heaven, for this is what really heaven is all about. This is what it inhabit, inhabits heaven. And it's not just a throne, it is the throne. 
the throne of God. 43 times in the book of Revelation we're going to see him talk about thrones. They are very important. And here we get a glimpse into that heavenly throne room. There's only a few times in the Bible that we are given a glimpse into this holy place. Do you remember the famous vision of Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 6 being one of them. We'll look at these more over the coming weeks. In Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, it says, In the year of King Uzziah, King Uzziah was a, a, old, an old Testament, a king of Israel in Old Testament times. He died, and then it says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. At that time in the nation's history, a great king, Uzziah, had just died. The nation was dis disillusioned after the death of King Uzziah. The, Nathan, the nation were looking for an empty throne. They were looking at an empty throne now, wondering who would sit on the throne now, who would fill his shoes. It was a time of change, a time of unrest, a time of unknown certainty. And I would say equally the church in the first century, they were troubled because of Caesar's throne. He was ruling as a god, he was persecuting the saints, John was exiled at that moment, it was a trying time. And you could say and apply that equally for many situations in our world today. In fact, I would say this is actually very typical of human history. Fallen mankind is not really fit to sit on a throne of this sort. Thrones come with power, they come with the authority to judge and the authority to punish. History is replete with tyrants who have gained power and used it to terrorise their people. And I did look at this. If you go through, there's lists of the ten worst rulers and the ten worst kings, the ten people with the biggest empires, the biggest kingdoms, as they call them, in history. There's not many good rulers that stand out, but there are so many bad ones. Starting right back in Old Testament times, that we can jump forward a little in history, whether it's a, a Nero or a Caligula, a Roman emperors, this is an etching, a, a drawing there of the famous story of Nero who set, the fire, set fire to Rome and then he had his musicians play as he sat there and he watched it burn. He was a crazy man by uh, all uh, accounts. The Roman emperor Caligula, you may know him, he was known for his uh, debauchery really, his despotic rule. Most of these people murdered all of their own families. They used to, uh, well Nero, you know, he used to use Christians, cover them in pitch and he'd use them as torches for his garden parties. This is what went on in the ancient world. I mean, this, these people, when you get that power, fallen man is not fit to sit on the throne. You can go forward in history. Ever heard of Vlad the Impaler? We call him Dracula. Actually, Vlad the Impaler was actually a real person in history. He was a ruler of Moldova during the days of the Ottoman Empire. He gained notoriety because not only was he a, a brilliant general in many ways, he was brutal to the core. He was called the Impaler because he issued a punishment throughout his kingdom that anyone, whether you're caught murdering or stealing a loaf of bread, it's death by impalement. That was the only punishment he had throughout his whole kingdom. Vlad the Impaler, that was his throne. Or you can go to probably one of the greatest warlords in the history of the world, Genghis Khan. He was the Mongolian war warlord. He created the largest empire that the world has really ever seen. It didn't last long, but it was absolutely massive. It said that he killed up to 40 million people on his rampages around Asia. On and on and on. You, you get my point. On and on and on. This list could go of people like this who had thrones, who had power, but yet there was no justice, no truth, and they were just doing what fallen man does. Judgment was decreed from the thrones, but there is no truth and justice. This is why I believe as we are about to move into the book of Revelation that sees things like this happening on the world, that we need to see the throne room, the throne room of the true God. That central vision of heaven is the throne. And throne is a furniture for a king. It's a place where authority, power and judgment come from. Yet this throne that we're going to see in Revelation is not like any throne that you've ever seen before. It's not like any earthly throne. There are many great thrones in the world. Think of the throne of Solomon. This is a biblical throne. 1 Kings 8 describes, uh, 1 Kings 10, sorry, describes Solomon's throne. The king made a great throne of ivory, overlaid it with refined gold. There were six steps to the throne and a round top to the throne at its rear and arms on each side of the seat. Two lions standing beside the arms. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps on the one side and on the other. Nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. The great throne of Solomon. This is the coronation chair of England. Has anyone ever seen that? The coronation chair of the English monarch. 
uh, 700 years old, stored away in Westminster Abbey. You may notice, again, I'll just no, tell you this, not really related, it's just an interesting historical aside. You can see underneath there, there is a stone underneath that chair. Can you see that? That's a very, it's called the Stone of Skun. It's an ancient artifact dating back, some people believe, to the you know, 700s. That was used in the coronations of Scottish rulers. It apparently came to Scotland through uh, very early Irish missionaries. There are legends that in the Celtic times that it was, in fact, they called it Jacob's Pillow. Missionaries brought it from the Middle East, and it was, of course, the pillow that Jacob laid his head on at Bethel. Now, of course, that, that's pretty easy to disprove, but that was the legend and the sort of mystical aura that was surrounding this stone. And when England took over Scotland in many ways, and there's whole sorts of legends going back, it was used in the coronation of the monarch. So what they would do, and only on the coronation of a monarch, they take this stone and they slip it under the chair like that. And you can imagine all the sort of mystical uh, legends that people have about this, that this is where they get their, their power to rule and all these sorts of things. It's very unusual, very weird. But that is it. You can actually go and see the stone of uh, Scone is actually it's called the stone of destiny. There you go. It's actually on display at the Edinburgh Castle Museum right now. Uh, we get, in 1996, the British government gave it back to Scotland as a sort of peace gesture, and they put it on display in there. However, at the next coronation, it will once again be used and stuck, stuck, put under the throne. That is um, what it has. That's the English monarch. Look at this one. This is the throne chair of Denmark. Now, you can't see it very well there, but this is the entire throne room, in fact. That is a, an ivory... Uh, throne seat and for many years it was believed it was the legend was it was made of unicorns for ancient, an ancient creature that they had uh, in those times we actually now know it's not unicorns it's actually made of narwhal tusks have you ever seen those unusual whales that have that massive horn it's actually made of narwhal tusks so it's an amazing thing and it was actually inspired by the description that we read about the, the throne room of Solomon so as that was ivory, this is, so this is what they've tried to model here. And they have these lions, these completely solid silver lions there to protect the, the throne room. It's quite an impressive thing by all, by all feats, even for the, for the world. However, I only share you these because in light of what we are about to read, these things just pale into all insignificance. They're nothing. There's no power associated with them when you're talking about the throne room of heaven. No one is impressed by them, least the Lord. We are about to look into the throne room of heaven. Now this is a vital point to remember about our universe, actually. Let's expand that to the whole universe. It's very easy to get tied up with our own situation, with our own uh, sort of bubble that we live in, in our own parts of the world. But one thing we do need to remember as we look at these things that can quite often be very depressing, there is an occupied throne in heaven. It's not an empty throne. It is an occupied throne in heaven, and upon it sits the ruler of the universe, the creator. This is the throne that Isaiah saw. This is the throne that John sees, and this is the one that we are about to look into. It is a throne, as Isaiah said, that is lofty and exalted. That means it is far above anything else. It is an exalted throne, one which is to be magnified in all its ways. It is far, far above you remember that famous or that mid-90s worship song, Above All Else, where it's speaking about the throne, above all powers, above all kings, above all nature, all created things, all wisdom, all the ways of man, above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders that the world has known, all wealth, all treasures of the earth. And then it goes on, there's no way to measure your worth. It's a great song speaking about the throne room of God. Truly, this throne, God's throne, is different than any other throne. Why? We're told in the book of Psalms, Psalm 89, verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of this throne. As we've seen, all those other thrones that men have sat upon, they've abused power and they've killed, they've rampaged, they've ravaged, and they've built their own kingdoms. The Lord's throne, the throne room of the universe, has as its very foundation righteousness and justice. And it says, loving kindness and truth go before you. That is the throne that you want in charge of the universe. And John is about to see this vision now. It is a time when the sovereign of the universe will take back his kingdom. And that means we need to stare at the majesty, the greatness, and the holiness of God before we read that. We need to look at the sovereign Lord. We need to know he is the one who has the right to rule. He is the one who, who can judge. This vision reminds the believer 
all things in this world are moving towards culmination of God's plan. This is not a world that was born by random chance. We are not the product of random chance, as many uh, ideologies would like to tell us today. Things are moving towards God's future. And when you understand biblical prophecy, you can see that is very, very true. We aren't left to guess at that. The future is set, it is secure, and it is a place where never again will wickedness sit on thrones. That will, they are, that's coming to an end. This is really a good way to visualise what we've called the cosmic battle of the ages. This is a good way to look at the difference between Christianity and atheism. In one, there is a universe with a throne. In the other, there is no throne, or they believe there is no throne. And when you believe there is no throne, you are free to exalt yourself into those positions. That is what the history of this world prove has happened. And we can take this even further, individually, as many evangelists have often done, and we can ask who is on the throne in your own life. It is either Christ or it is yourself. And I can guarantee you, one of those people is ultimately not fit to rule from a throne. And the other gave everything so that you could sit on his throne with him and rule. That is ultimately the future of Jesus Christ and those who are his in his body. We need to give Christ the place he deserves in our lives. We crown him as king of kings. We enter into the life he has prepared for us by repentance and faith. We receive his mercy and forgiveness and the blessings to come in the future. Let's look at this throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. You can sort of sense here that he's almost lost for words. Like he doesn't quite know how to describe what he is seeing with this scene. And I think that's absolutely true. Language fails him at this point. He does not have the words to actually describe something that is otherworldly like this. It's almost beyond what words can convey. But there are some, some descriptions that he gives here that I want to just focus in on that they are instructive to us. Jasper. If you've seen a jasper stone, it was a very, it's a clear crystal-like looking gem. Sardis is more of a ruby, like we would say, like a red, deep red ruby stone. And then it says a multicolored emerald rainbow round about the throne. Now, do you remember, the Apostle Paul writes about God who dwells in unapproachable light. This is not a physical form on the God is spirit in this sense, and it is an unapproachable light. And what is being described here, if you've ever seen light shine through a diamond or shine through a jewel, and you get those beautiful prisms coming from it. This is almost something that I see that John is looking at here. All he can describe is just this light shining through, these beautiful colours coming through it, and that's what he describes. However, there's a background to these meaning. Like I said, remember, this book draws on the Old Testament. These stones to Jewish readers would have had much more important significance. In Exodus 28, you get the description of this man called the High Priest of Israel. And on the High Priest... He had a breastplate, you can just about see it there, that contained 12 different stones, all of these different uh, rare gems. And on each stone was inscribed one of the names of Israel, Levi, Benjamin, all the different tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the idea is he'd have these names written on him because he would be representing the entire nation before God. That's why we have it. However, if you go through Exodus, you'll learn that the Jasper stone the, the one, uh, the first, represented the first tribe of Reuben. And the last tribe was Benjamin, which was the Sardis stone. So you have the Jasper and the Sardis stone, which are both the first and the last of these two stones. So in many ways, you could even say that that is pointing us to an identification that this is the first and the last. Do you remember in the beginning of Revelation? What did Jesus say? We spend a lot of time on it. It's a name that speaks about the eternality of God. When John fell down, when he'd seen the vision of the Lord, the Lord came to him, put his hand on his shoulder and said, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. And that is what these two stones are referring to. But there's a little bit more to it. Reuben, which is the first name, means this, behold a son. That is what actually the name Reuben means, if you translate it. The name Benjamin means the son of my right hand. So you have behold a son and you have the son of my right hand. So these two stones point us towards the divine son. 
The actual stones have that meaning in their very names, that this is the son who has been given all authority to rule and judge and who is seated at the right hand of the father. These are titles you will find applied to Jesus Christ. He is exalted to the right hand of the father at this time. Revelation is going to explain to you that he leaves that place and he comes down to the earth to claim his throne, the throne of David. That is what this whole book is about. But in many ways, I believe that is what is being conveyed here um, through John and through this vision. These two stones point us back to the identification of the first and the last and of Jesus Christ. Now, you could say that everything in heaven points towards Jesus Christ. Everything in the Bible points towards Jesus Christ. He is really everything. He is the one, it says, who will be all in all. Everything flows from him, everything was created by him, one day everything will flow back to him. This is why, and I've mentioned it a few times, to understand the magnitude of the question when Jesus was here incarnate on this earth, the same one that we're reading about now, when he was walking and sleeping and eating with his disciples, and he said to them, who do you say that I am? The magnitude of that question is so large, because if you get that question wrong, well, this is the whole, this is it's the most important question you'll ever answer in your entire life. And do you remember the narrative when Peter then said, you are Christ, the son of the living God? That was the right answer. You are Christ, the son of the living God. So the question is still asked today. Ultimately, as we've seen into this throne room, we're going to look at it more and more as we go through the next few weeks. The question that resounds, that is crying from it, to a world that is in darkness, that is seeking answers and other things, is what will you do with Jesus Christ? What is his answer? You can prove through the prophecies that he is the one he said he would be. He is here for a specific purpose, and that is actually to make sure that you are part of his kingdom, that you will have eternity with him, and not be caught up in what is about to come on this earth as he comes to claim back his throne. That is a very serious question for all of us. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Or as we saw last week in that final book, the letter, he is the Amen, he is the faithful and true witness, the throne is his, the earth is his. And we would say on this earth, long live the King. But I believe we would say all hail the Lamb to this now. Amen? Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We do say all hail the Lamb, Lord. We thank you for everything that you've done, revealing yourself to us, coming to this earth to die for us, that we can be reconciled to you. And Lord, I pray now that as we enter these holy things, Lord, as we look upon the throne room of God and then we see uh, what's going to happen on this earth, that we would be drawn to you, Lord. We find our refuge, our safety in you. We pray that we would be faithful ambassadors to you in this world, that you would empower us by your spirit, Lord, to be a light in this world as you've called us to be, that we would hold up Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and people would be drawn to him, Lord God. May the message of the gospel permeate through this church, through this town, Lord. In Jesus' name, for his sake we pray. Amen. You've been listening to Thomas Fretwell. For more resources or to support the ministry, please go to ezrafoundation.org.